All right. Welcome, everyone, to Value Investing Live. I'm pleased to introduce Joe Boscovich, Jr., co-founder of Old West Investment Management. Old West manages more than $150 million in assets under management across long-only and long-short strategies. These strategies are based upon the companies they uncover through a simple yet sound investment process. Focused on value and special situation opportunities, they are concentrated in their best ideas with roughly 60% of capital invested in their top 10 holdings. As a first principle, Old West believes the soundest way to protect and grow their capital is by aligning themselves with management teams who have high stock ownership, smart pay, and great capital allocation track records. The end of August saw Old West's all-cap long-only strategy and their long-short strategy beating the year-to-date return to the S&P 500. As always, for those of you out in the audience, please feel free to post your questions and comments throughout the entire presentation, but keep in mind that we will hold those questions until the end when we jump into the Q&A. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand things over to Joe so we can jump into his presentation. Great. Well, um, uh, thanks to Charlie and Graham and the entire team at Guru Focus for inviting me to be uh, a presenter at the Value Investing Live um, uh, spirit, uh, series speaker. As Graham mentioned, my name is Joe Boscovich, and I am a partner with Los Angeles-based uh, Old West Investment Management. Um, so I thought I'd start off by talking about our investment uh, philosophy and process a little bit, and then uh, talk a bit about how we typically uh, generate new ideas. And then I could uh, jump in, in, into our portfolio. And as Graham mentioned, um, you know, we, we subscribe to the Charlie Munger and, and Warren Buffett philosophy of uh, own a, owning a small basket and watching that basket closely. So, you know, roughly 60% of our, 50% of our capital, 60% of our capital is in our top 10 names. So, as I as I kind of jump into the portfolio, you'll you'll learn uh, a great deal about um, you know what we own. I, I think I'll probably talk about seventy to eighty percent of our portfolio. Um, I guess I'd, I'd start out by saying that I, I feel like this is a very strange uh, investment uh, investing environment. Um, you know, we feel that valuations uh, are extremely stretched. Um, everything looks really expensive. Not a lot makes sense. Uh, but at the same time, I can tell you that we've never been more excited about our portfolio and what we own. And we think there is incredible upside um, for, for really most of our holdings. And I think, you know, a lot of this kind of dichotomy can be attributed to this explosion in passive investing, which I know, you know, Guru Focus has talked about, you know, a number of times, but you know, because of this explosion in passive investing, I feel like, um, you know, a handful of names uh, have extremely stretched valuations. Um, and it's really kind of a small handful of names, but those small handful of names also represent a, a majority uh, percentage of, of the index weightings. So, you know, the general market is very expensive, yet I feel that there are a lot of, you know, smaller uh, uh, less known companies that, that just represent phenomenal, uh, buying opportunities today. Um, you know, so first I wanted to start on this slide, just discussing our investment philosophy. And I, you know, we kind of break down our, our philosophy into to three kind of main bullet points. Um, you know, one would be people, um, you know, we believe that all businesses are ultimately a collection of people and ideas. And we aim to align ourselves with intelligent owner operators and investors with successful track records. Um, I think that's pretty uh, self-explanatory and I'll talk a little bit more about that later when I talk about idea generation. Um, you know, two fundamental business analysis. Uh, we uh, spend a lot of time studying the, the businesses that we own. We want to know, you know, how do those businesses make money today? How will they grow revenue and earnings in the future? And, um, you know, simply we consider ourselves business people who merely transact through those publicly traded securities. And we don't view stocks as pieces of paper that trade up and down, but in, instead of fractional or equivalent ownership stakes in, in, in 
those companies. Um, you know, and then finally, you know, value investing. We are value investors at our core. Um, but I also feel like, you know, value investing is probably uh, an overused term. And there's such a, such a big, broad range of what value investing means. Um, you know, we believe that all value, all, all, all investing is value investing. And, you know, the thought of buying an asset um, just because it's cheap, uh, uh, that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. And, you know, buying an asset that's growing that is too expensive doesn't make a lot of sense either. So, you know, you know simply we don't want to overpay uh, for the assets that we own. And, and, but I think what's really important is we spend a lot of time trying to understand the catalysts that will unlock that value. You know, cheap stocks are usually cheap for a reason and they stay cheap. Um, so like I said, we, we really try to identify those catalysts that will unlock that value. Um, you know, on, on this page, we, you know, we talk about our investment process, kind of our starting point being the proxy statement and not all ideas are, you know, is the proxy statement necessarily the starting point? But I think the important thing to, to know here is that in every company we own, um, we usually end up back at the proxy. And, and the, the key point here is that we really only want to own companies where management has more to gain or lose through their ownership than they do through their compensation. And um, you know, down here, there's four pictures of, of business leaders that kind of you know pass that that proxy test. Um, you could see in the in the center uh, left here is a picture of John Malone. I'm sure many of you listeners are familiar with John Malone and Liberty Media, but you know this is a little dated. But from this proxy a few years ago, you could see that his salary and bonus was about seven hundred thousand dollars, and his ownership stock ownership in the company was one point four billion. Um, you know the, the the picture next to him, Prem Watsa known as the Oracle of Ontario. He's the chairman of Fairfax Financial. His salary plus bonus a couple of years ago was around 600,000. His stock ownership, 1.2 billion. So, you know, I think the thing to really take away from there is, is um, without knowing anything else about these companies or these, or these gentlemen, um, they care more about that stock price than they do their take home pay. And that alone aligns them much more with stockholders and stakeholders um, than, than the vast majority of companies. And I, I, you know, I would just say that this alone doesn't, doesn't mean that these are good investments, um, doesn't mean that, that we would necessarily own these companies, but it's a great starting point. And, and I would argue, why would you want to own a company where, where these dynamics weren't, weren't um, a part of the equation? Um, you know, next year uh, on this slide, I talk a little bit about um, how we typically generate ideas, how you know, they come into our focus. And you know, we talk a lot about how there's you know, thousands of publicly traded companies um, and you wanna make sure that you kind of, um, you've heard the term fish where the fish are and spend most of your time on ideas that will end up being actionable. Um, so you could see here on the top, one way in which we oftentimes generate ideas would be through our uh, daily work on SEC Form 4 filings, 13D filings, 13G filings, 144 filings. But you know, just as an example, um, when an insider at a company, a CEO, chairman, someone that's part of the executive management, someone on the board of directors buys or sells stock, they have to file what's called a Form 4 with the SEC, and that's public information within 48 hours. And um, you know, rather than uh, you know, reading some sell-side research report or sourcing ideas from some financial publication. Um, it just makes sense to us that you might find actionable ideas, you know, this way. And just because a CEO or someone on the board, uh, you know, writes a check, uh, buying two, three, four million dollars worth of stock with their own after-tax capital, that doesn't mean we're going to follow them into that idea. That doesn't mean um, that the idea is actionable. But you know, maybe uh, we should spend a little bit of our time trying to see if we could see what they do. And to kind of you know, step back and give you a kind of a, a little bit of a story of, of you know, why that is such an um, you know, important part of idea generation for, for our company. Um, our chairman and chief investment officer, 
here at Old West is, is my dad, Joe Voskovich Sr. And he entered the investment management business 25 years ago. Um, prior to getting into the investment business, um, he ran a, a family owned uh, farming and food processing um, operation called Voskovich Farms. Um, at the time, Boscovich Farms, they were the largest client to a, a small regional Southern California-based bank called San, Santa Clarita National Bank. And the chairman of that bank thought it'd be a good idea to have board representation from, from our family business on the board. And he invited my dad to, to join the board in his late 20s, early 30s. And my dad uh, uh, recounts um, going to these quarterly board meetings. And every quarter, there was always a page of the of the board book dedicated to stock transactions throughout the prior quarter. And it was a very thinly traded bank. Um, so there wasn't much stock that traded, but anytime there was any stock that traded, he always noticed it was the chairman of the bank buying the stock. And he witnessed this quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter, and finally approached the bank chairman and asked if he could buy stock alongside of him. And, um, he, you know, bought a fair amount of stock for someone in his, in his late 20s and early 30s. Well, fast forward several years, Santa Clarita National Bank sold to for a specific bank, which then sold to Bank of America. And my dad made quite a bit of money for someone in his, I, I believe, mid-30s by that time. But, you know, the, the point of this all is that, um, you know, no matter how much you think you know about a company, uh, no matter how sound and rigorous your analysis is, um, maybe you don't know as much as the people running that business. And I, I think that's a, something not to uh, forget because this is a business where I think you have a lot of, you know, smart analysts, smart people that think they know more about that business, including the people running it. So, you know, this whole concept of, of watching what insiders are doing with their money rather than listening to what they're saying, um, that's a very ingrained concept in our DNA. Um, you know, two here, uh, you, you talk about how, you know, every quarter we scour through a number of 13F filings, looking at what other investors um, are, are buying into their portfolio, what they're increasing, what they're decreasing, and, and you know, kind of monitoring some of that, that activity. And I think, you know, the concept here is that we don't have a monopoly on all great ideas. And you know, I've been in this business for about 20 years, and I will tell you that on the investment side, one of the kind of intangibles that I hold nearest and dearest to me is the network um, of other investors that I've built. You know, other investors that I think are really smart, work really hard. Um, there's a lot of diligence that goes into their work. Um, I think it just would make sense that you would pay attention to what they're buying. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've heard about uh, a lot of great business leaders have talked about the value of reading books, right? And you might have an author that he has spent, you know, months, most likely years, maybe decades of his life, um, you know, putting everything in his heart and in his head um, in that book and, and, you know, reading that and, and soaking up that person's lifetime of experience. Um, you know, there's probably not a better return um, in terms of time spent. So, you know, same here. You know, I think there's companies where, you know, there's other investors, like I said, that I think are, are, are very savvy and they've spent hours, maybe months, maybe years, maybe decades learning a company and to, to you know, monitor what they're buying through their quarterly 13F filings or, you know, talking to them and having a regular dialogue just seems very smart. Um, you know, third here, we talk once again, I mentioned this earlier, but, you, you know, doing a lot of business analysis, um, understanding the businesses, understanding the, the industries in terms of the ecosystems that those businesses operate in. How do they make money? Um, how are they going to make money? Um, you know, we read the industry periodicals, talk to customers, competitors, suppliers, but really trying to understand that business landscape. And then finally, you know, we look at special situations such as spinoffs and companies and or industries that have undergone sharp corrections or prolonged downturns that mask underlying value. Well, we can understand why that company is structurally, structurally misunderstood and mispriced. Um, 
you know, we also, we look for companies, uh, kind of focus on companies that have some sort of structural growth tailwind. And um, I would also, you know, asymmetric upside. I think a lot of our investments have this huge asymmetric upside where, you know, we feel that, that the risk we're taking owning that investment is far outweighed by, by the, 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 the giant upside. Um, you know, in, in terms of looking for investments, like I said, focusing on special situations like spinoffs, and there's a variety of other special situations, but where we could understand why something is misunderstood or mispriced, I think is very important. You know, this is a, this is a very challenging business. And I think it's important to understand that when you buy a stock, you're, you're buying that stock from someone selling it to you. So, you know, really you're kind of making a judgment that you know more about that company than the person selling it to you. And I think when you focus on a lot of, you know, big companies that are widely owned, um, that's kind of a, a, you know, big assumption. There's a lot of smart people. Um, why do you know more than they do? And I think when you focus on certain companies where it could be a number of things, maybe institutions can't own it because the company is too small. Um, there's a number of different things, um, but, but, you know, really try to understand why that business is on sale. Um, so with that said, I thought we'd kind of jump into our portfolio. So our, our biz, biggest exposure in our portfolio currently is to a basket of, you know, uranium mining companies. Um, I wrote uh, down here some of the, the largest exposures, you know, Cameco Corporation, which is the largest North American producer, uh, Next Gen Energy, Energy Fuels. Energy Fuels is one of the only uh, producers here in the United States. Uh, Centris Energy, they are actually an enricher of uranium. Um, but you can see that, and th there's a cu couple of others that we own, um, but you could see uh, that that's currently 35% of our capital in our kind of in our, in our main fund. Um, but you know, uh, uranium is a commodity. It's a commodity where demand is much, much, much greater than supply and um, more supply needs to be brought online to meet that demand. But in order to bring new supply online, uh, producers of uranium need to be incentivized with prices that are at least 100% greater than the current spot market price. And um, so it's going to be really interesting. And we expect um, you know big, big things in this space. Um, I would also note that this has become, you know, such a, a large conviction of ours that, um, it will, I guess, first off, you know, our, our work in this uranium mining uh, industry, um, a lot of it is, most of it is driven by by my business partner, Brian Lax, who, um, if you have an interest, I would recommend that, that you get on the phone with him. I do not think there are many people in the investment management business that understand this industry and have done more work on this industry than Brian. Actually, to the point where a couple of years ago, uh, we all we also we launched another fund, which is a, a clean energy focused fund, which is currently uh, just about all focused um, in the uranium sector. And like I said, we expect uh, uh, big things out of it. Um, so on this slide, what is uranium? So uranium is the feedstock used to fuel nuclear power plants. Uh, nuclear energy currently produces 11% of the world's electricity and 20% of our electricity here in the United States. And I think it's probably also important to note that close to 60% of our clean energy is generated from nuclear power. Um, you know, taken together, there are about 30 countries that use nuclear energy and, and uh, there, you know, the, the biggest users would be uh, uh, France, which gets almost 80% of their energy from nuclear power. And then there's a number of other countries like uh, Slovakia and Sweden and Switzerland that, 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 you know, are, are close to that 70% um, electricity uh, uh, from nuclear. Um, and by the way, as, as I'm sure a lot of you have read, those are also the countries that have uh, the, the, clean, the cleanest um, uh, uh, climates. Um, so nuclear energy, it's the only carbon-free source of electricity that can be ramped up to massive scale um, because it's not intermittent, meaning that um, it's, it's the only carbon-free source of electricity that can run just about 24-7. 
Uh, wind only works when it's windy. Solar, solar only works when it's sunny. Hydro needs to be near water. Um, but like I said, nuclear energy could run just about 24 seven and it's the only carbon free source of electricity that can do that. Um, and then I would also, you know, note that as a fuel source, it's, it's performance is unmatched. I think this is an interesting, you know, visual down below, but you could see, you know, the size of a nuclear pellet and, you know, one tiny nuclear pellet, um, is the equivalent to 1.7 tons of coal. So a kilogram of uranium can provide uh, a million times the energy of an equivalent mass of natural gas and 3 million times that of a kilogram of coal. Um, you know, I would also note here that, uh, and I think this is important because a lot of people are misin misinformed when it comes to nuclear energy, but it's the cleanest and safest form of, of, of energy uh, production. You know, the more that people learn about nuclear power, the more supportive they are. Um, and you can see these, these two uh, diagrams down below. Um, you know, the first one on the left, it, it's, it's, like I said, it's the cleanest form of, of, of electricity and it's carbon free. And, and on the right here, you can see that it's the safest too. And there's fewer accidents than all other um, uh, form, forms of energy production. I mean, just, just for an example, nuclear power releases less radi radiation into the environment than any other major energy source. They say if you live next door to a nuclear power plant your entire life, you would be exposed to less radiation than on a single flight from Los Angeles to New York. So like I said, I think there's a lot of misinformation um, about nuclear, uh, a lot of fear mongering, um, but that's quickly changing. Um, you see, the, you know, both political parties have, have really adopted it as, as the fastest way to slash greenhouse gas emissions and decarbonize the economy. Um, you know, so really fast, why does this opportunity exist? You know, wh why are people selling these equities to me at such a cheap price? Well, if you go back to March 2011, there was a magnitude 9.0 earthquake off the coast of Japan, and there was a, a tsunami uh, that followed and that flooded the Fukushima power plant. Um, at the time, Japan had about 50 reactors that represented over 10% of the global fleet. And as a precaution, Japan took their entire nuclear fleet offline. And so that really almost overnight threw the industry into the, the situation where there was now um, excess supply. And, um, you know, that excess production and inventory level caused a severe decline in the price from roughly $70 a pound. And it reached, you know, I think as low as $15 a pound, um, which was significantly below the cost that miners need, need to produce the metal. And it, and it really made mining uranium completely uneconomical. Um, and as a result of that price collapse, that has led to huge, huge production cuts. Um, and this, this prolonged environment has lasted the last, the, the last decade. You know, at the peak of the last um, high in the uranium market, there were about 500 uranium resource companies. Well, today there are about 40. This was a $150 billion industry 10 years ago. It got as low as 5 billion. So once again, you know, why is why are these companies being sold to me at such a cheap price? Well, at such a small industry, you know, 5 billion, now it's probably about a seven to $10 billion industry. Um, this is un, uninvestable for 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 most people for more for just about all institutions and if institutions can uh, buy it it's because Adam Prom or Cameco which are the two largest producers and and the other are definitely uninvestable just because they're so small um, so you've had all these companies go away uh, now we're very concentrated in just a handful of producers developers or explorers and then I think it's important to note that the surviving producers have also been forced to su suspend production. So um, uh, Kazatom Prom, which is the state-sponsored entity in uh, uh, Kazakhstan, and they're the largest producer of uranium, they've announced significant supply cuts. And then Cameco Corporation, which is a Canadian-based public company, they're the second largest producer. They shut down their largest mine, MacArthur River, um, completely took it offline indefinitely. And um, so you've had this huge supply cutback. And you know, I would also note that, you know, because Adam Prom and Cameco combined represent uh, roughly 60% of global production, which is just, you know, that, 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 that's just mind boggling when you think about 60% of production comes from two producers. 
So, you know, with that $25 million supply coming offline, um, it, we point this, it, it's written here in the presentation, but we pointed off that that represents about 20% of global supply. So, you know, to put that into perspective, that would be the equivalent of Saudi Arabia and Russia completely seizing oil production. Imagine what would happen to the price of oil um, if, that, if that were the case. Um, if you go to the next slide here, so now you have this significant supply um, deficit. And, and meanwhile, um, reactors are being built globally at a pretty fast pace. So, you know, once again, when you get back to what we look for in companies, so not only do we look for, for companies where, um, you know, that have maybe gone through this prolonged downturn or some a sh a sharp correction, but also looking for companies uh, where there are structural growth uh, tailwinds. And that's definitely the case in uranium. You can see that there are about 450 operable nuclear power plants uh, globally, but you have about another 500 that are either under construction in the proposed uh, ordered and planned stage or and, and proposed stage. And, you know, China will be tripling their nuclear power capacity over the next 10 years. India, India will be bringing on 21 new plants in the next 10 years. Japan is bringing on uh, many of the reactors that they uh, originally shut down. So it, it is a growth industry. Um, and, you know, here you could see on this slide that that is triggering a cycle shift. The uranium deficit is here and history tends to repeat itself. Um, you could see on this uh, graph below um, what has happened to the price of uranium um, when this industry has swung um, into a supply deficit. Uh, before, and uh, we are entering uh, the biggest supply deficit we've had. Um, the level of demand will, is going to require much higher prices to encourage new sources of supply. Um, you know, on, on this slide, I would just point out that the uranium market is unique in that it is characterized. Um, there, there are two different prices to look at. So you have the long-term contracting price and you have the spot price. Well, 90% of uranium is traded at the long-term contracting price. And that is the price that is agreed between the miners and utilities. Um, these are characterized by long 70 to 10 year contracts. And most of these were entered into, uh, you know, preceding the March, 2011 Fukushima accident and they've begun to roll off and the utilities are needing to um, enter into new contracts with the miners to secure their supply. Um, what they have been doing the last few years is, is, is rather than you know, producing new uranium, the miners have just been buying off the spot market and delivering that material into their long-term contracts. And there is you know, evidence that, that there is very little uh, supply left on the spot market. And it's a very shallow market. Um, there's not a lot traded there. Um, so, as contracts are entered into, um, you know, we believe that prices will not only rise, but they'll rely, uh, rise significantly. As I, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the producers need uh, 2x uh, or more just to, just to uh, break even on, on, on new production. Um, and then finally, I think this is really important too, because the buyers are price insensitive. You can see that the typical cost of, of uh, constructing a, a nuclear power plant is between five and ten billion dollars. Well, the annual annual uranium need is only fifteen million. So, um, uh, these utilities they're going to buy, and it really doesn't matter what the price is as they start entering into new contracts. And we believe that that is imminent and right around the corner. Um, so. Once again, as I started, we have really, uh, you know, approached uh, this exposure through buying a, a, a basket of the miners. The miners are extremely levered uh, to, to a rise in prices. And as, as the uranium prices rebound, the demand for uranium miners coupled with a lack of supply will exaggerate the share price increases of equities. So we're invested in a handful of names, um, a basket of uranium companies and the landscape consists of companies that you know, can be categorized as producers, developers, and explorers. And we own the companies that represent the very best projects in all stages of development and that are led by good management teams with significant interest. So you know, if you look at this graph below, 
um, you know, Global Atomic, Vimy, Denison, Fish, and Ugo VX, Bannerman, a lot of those we just owned in our, our uranium and our clean energy fund that's, you know, dedicated to uranium. But, you know, NextGen, for example, that's one of the, uh, the names that um, we own in our, in our main fund, and it's a, it's a significant exposure. So just, you know, as a case example, um, it is uh, uh, in a safe jurisdiction, high grade, you can see 300 million pounds of resource, it's the largest undeveloped uranium deposit in the world, and it's amongst the highest grade zones in the world at close to 20% uranium, which is more than 100 times the world average. Um, you can see here, we, we, we put the, the market cap and compare it to the project and, uh, net present value, but at $50 uranium, and we feel very confident that the price is going to, the long-term contracting price will get there. It has to get there. Uh, the project has a net present value of 3 billion, over 5X the current enterprise value. So we expect this to be a huge uh, investment for us. And, and as do we, the, 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 the names that we own in the basket, and then, um, you know, earlier I talked about management and how management is, is paramount. And uh, you can see here that the CEO has a substantial stock position and they receive a significant portion of their, their pay, incentive pay and stock. And then I think this is very interesting that in the last few years, Lee Kashin, who is one of Hong Kong's richest men, took a 20% ownership stake in the company. And I, I, I would, would find that all, uh, you know, very interesting and, and, and has increased our conviction in a name such as NextGen. So, you know, that's uranium, that's 35% exposure in our fund. Uh, next year, you can see we have gold miners. Um, I didn't write the percentage here, but, you know, our basket of gold miners is about 25% of our fund. So, you know, right there, that's 60% that's of our fund, uranium and gold combined. But, um, you know, <laughs> with gold, uh, Central banks around the world are printing their currencies as fast as they can, and there's no end in sight. Um, we don't know, none of us know how this, this turns out, but um, uh, this could very easily lead to hyperinflation and, and you know, really a destruction of wealth for anybody that you know, holds um, for, for savers and people that own, own fiat currency. And if, you know, if you look at this slide here, fiat money versus gold, um, you know, John Maynard Keynes, this is a great quote. I like this quote. By a continuing process of inflation, government can confiscate secretly an important part of the wealth of their citizens. Um, you know, Warren Buffett talks about how, you know, inflation is the cruelest form of tax that fewer than one out of a hundred Americans understand, or I'm sorry, one out of a million Americans understands. Um, and then this quote from JP Morgan's great, gold is money, everything else is credit. And once you realize this, you will never be poor again. Um, I love this visual right here on the left of, of this dollar bill. You could see that back in 1913, if you had a dollar, it was worth a dollar. Um, today, it's worth about five cents. Um, but since the beginning of time, fiat money has always failed throughout history due to the same pattern of rapid devaluation. Um, and I think in order to stop the dollar from falling further, the market needs to let market interest rates rise significantly um, to rebuild confidence in the dollar. And we can't afford that. You know, we tried to go up to 2% a couple of years ago and, and the market fell 20% and we're basically trapped at 0% because of the enormity of our, our, our debt. And, you know, you could see that the, once again, that visual of the dollar has lost 98% of its purchasing power since 1913. And if you look at the, uh, the graph below that, I think this is also a great visual. So, you know, not only has the dollar lost 98% of its purchasing power since 1913, but gold has increased more than 60X in value during that same time. And, um, you know, gold has been valued as, it has been valued for as long as human civilization has existed. No monetary good has a history as long and storied as gold. And gold is a physical, tangible, and real asset, and we view it as a currency. Um, this is a great little timeline, I think, of the Federal Reserve balance sheet. And like I said, we have you know unprecedented money printing by central banks, and um, we don't know how it ends, but it could lead to hyperinflation. So I think it's a great protection in the portfolio. And you know, if you start at the beginning here in 2008, the Fed had an 800 billion dollar balance sheet. And then in response to the, uh, the, the Great Recession, um, 
low interest rates wasn't working. So we experimented with quantitative easing and launched QE1. And that was, you know, in, in 2009 and 10. And then in 2011, we followed up with QE2. And then in 2013, 14, we followed up with QE, QE3. And then after pausing for a while, um, you know, we sat there and, and, and tried to uh, walk back some of that stimulus um, in, in 2018. And you guys all remember what happened in 2018, but the Fed aborted its attempt to normalize interest rates and shrink its balance sheet. And they quickly reversed course and began cutting rates in early 2019 uh, when the stock market fell 20%. And, you know, then we, you know, we had, I, I, I'm of the feeling that, that, uh, you know, th this coronavirus really, you've heard a number of people, you know, talk about this, but really what coronavirus was, is it was the pin that, that pricked the bubble. And if it wasn't for coronavirus, something else would have pricked the bubble. And uh, to pop that bubble from deflating, uh, you know, the Fed came to the rescue again and, and announced QE4 or, or QE infinity, as we know. And you know, what's really interesting is, is there is more quantitative easing in QE4 than in all the other QEs combined. Um, I think this is, you know, so we had a, like I said, we had an $800 billion balance sheet in 08, went to 4 trillion, try to normalize it. And, uh, you know, now we're sitting here with a $4 trillion balance sheet. We're running uh, $4 trillion deficits. And I think this is an amazing stat that you can see here. 60 cents of every dollar being spent by the government is being printed. And that is, I mean, just think about that. 60 cents of every dollar being spent by the government is being printed. So I think um, you're fooling yourself if, if, if you think we will be able to crawl out of this debt. Um, I think it's just going to get more and more and more. And gold is a, is a phenomenal protection. And, you know, this next slide is great because we talk about, you know, insider buying and watching insiders. And, you know, in, in, in this instance, I think the ultimate insider buying are, are the world central banks. Um, central banks are buying their most gold today than at any point since 1967. They know that their efforts to pump liquidity um, is failing and has, has created significant consequences that the, as the utility of that money continues to, to diminish. Um, gold, as we mentioned, believe, we believe it continues to have intrinsic value. So, so, it, so it reassures countries, especially if they fear inflation in long terms. Um, so, you know, gold investments, once again, we own a basket of gold mining stocks. Um, you know, I think it's, 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 uh, you know, gold exploded higher during QE1 and QE3. And, um, you know, I think you look at gold miners today, uh, you know, we feel like gold miners will be one, if not the only industry showing strong earnings growth, uh, you know, for years to come. If you look at, you know, recent quarterly numbers for the miners, they've been great. And that, you know, was with gold averaging, you know, less than the, the, the $1,900, $2,000 an ounce. It, it, it's trading that now. Uh, most gold miners are sharply raising dividends. You know, I mean, uh, imagine that. Uh, companies raising dividends every quarter during this, you know, pandemic period. And then, um, you know, gold miners today, uh, you know, they're, like I said, they're trading about uh, 1,900, 2,000 an ounce. Um, and the, the best gold miners, a lot of the ones that we own, they have $900 average all in sustaining costs. And these companies have higher margins uh, today than they have, um, you know, at, at, at any other time in, in their history. Um, so we think the gold bull market is here. And, uh, the amazing thing is these miners are nowhere near the levels they attained, um, you know, during the, during the prior bull markets. And this is a great graph, uh, showing that how gold rallied to new all time highs, um, well before the S and P recovered. And I know the S and P has recovered, but, you know, we think that is, um, that is, is fake and, and, and it's been engineered by the central banks. Um, so I've talked about two major themes in the portfolio where baskets of companies, you know, call it 10, 12 different companies make up 60% of the portfolio. And now, uh, you know, I'll turn to some, you know, 
names that are very fundamental bottom up uh, owning specific companies. Uh, this is a company that I am just, you know, incredibly, incredibly excited by. It's a, it's an 8% position in our portfolio. Um, it's one of my favorite holdings. Um, and I, I, I think at first, you know, just give you a little bit of corporate background and how we became interested, but you know, let me go back here. So, so wild brain, what it is, is it, it's a kid's content company. They, uh, own IP. They partner with IP. They create cartoons for those IP. Um, they distribute those cartoons to linear broadcast networks, to the major SVOD platforms, and on their own AVOD network. And then for a second in income stream, they license that IP to uh, uh, you know, toy companies um, and about a million other uh, 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 consumer products outlets, um, which is tremendous high margin business. And, and, and you'll see why I think that this stock could just um, just do tremendous over the, the, the next couple of years. Um, a little bit of background on the company. Um, in 2006, there were two uh, children, Canadian-based children entertainment companies that, that, that merged. Um, and over the next uh, five to, or I guess over the next 10 years, they kind of went on a buying binge and rolled up a bunch of different smaller kids content companies. And um, although that roll-up strategy, I think assembled an incredible portfolio of IP, um, it lacked uh, vision for managing, developing and nurturing uh, that content. And I think it's important to know that prior management lacked the experience needed to develop that 360 degree approach from content production to brand licensing in order to push the IP through every stage of brand extension. Um, so that's why I think such a great company is available at such cheap prices. I think a lot of people have been turned off by this name, but it's a very different company today. So we first, became, how do we become interested in this company? I think this is interesting because if you go back to idea, to idea generation, you'll recall that one of the ways we generate ideas is is looking at the 13 F findings of investors that we have a high regard for. And uh, there is a, a fund out of New York uh, called Fine Capital Management uh, that was started by Deborah Fine, who used to run family office for the Tisch family. And um, the current CIO of that company, a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Witcher, I have um, followed him for some time. I think they are a very, very smart group. They do tremendous work. And uh, once again, if, if, you know, it, it, I think it's just, it's a no brainer to at least be aware of what they own. So it first came to our attention in 2015, Fine Capital uh, pitched, uh, uh, at the time the company was called DHX Media, as I just mentioned, and they pitched it at the Sony conference in New York. Um, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, kind of the gist of, of the pitch was, you know, kids content uh, never grows stale, a new generation, watches it over and over and over again, um, lends itself to consumer products more than other content, and that's high margin business. And uh, it all made sense to me and I loved it. Um, you know, at the time though, the company's flagship brand was, was a, a piece of property called Teletubbies, which some of you may be interested or, or familiar with. And, you know, although extremely popular and profitable as a brand in the 2000s, I had some reservations regarding the ever the evergreen identity of that IP, and uh, so we passed. And uh, but I always kept an eye on the company and watched it, monitored it, and our feelings on the company began to change in 2017 when DHX Media bought um, the Peanuts franchise, Charlie Brown and Snoopy from Iconics Brands, and you know we believed that Peanuts was an evergreen franchise and. And although it, you know, kind of reached its peak of popularity decades ago, um, and there has not been uh, really new, fresh, exciting content, I think that Peanuts has proven to be one of the top family brands worldwide. Um, you know, just if you look at consumer products revenue, it's, it, I think it's the number six family brand worldwide. So the evergreen status can't really be uh, uh, argued, in my opinion. Um, you know, and then uh, upon deeper analysis, uh, you know, what we did realize is that uh, 
you know, DHX Media, uh, what, 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 we, what we quickly discovered was that they had a breakout business that was, at the time it was in its infancy and just starting. And I think this is important because, you know, as I mentioned, we want to find companies with great management teams. You know, I didn't really talk a lot about competitive moats, um, owning great franchises, but that's, 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 you know, an important uh, 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 criteria. Um, Valuation is obviously important, but but if you recall earlier, I talked about how we look for you know cheap companies, but that have some sort of structural growth tailwind, and I think oftentimes that can be found in businesses uh, that have a breakout business from within, where everybody's focused on you know the core business, but they have this tiny breakout business that is just growing rapidly, and that's the case in um, uh, Wild Brain or DHX Media uh, at that point, they had a, a breakout business, a subsidiary called Wild Brain and that, like I said, it was in its infancy and that was its AVOD business where they were um, creating content for all the different AVOD services such as YouTube. And, and actually they're now the, the, the largest creator of, of kids content on YouTube and other AVOD services. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but you know, as we discovered that business, and then you know you discover that it had an award-winning brand licensing agency attached to it called CPLG, and you know really what Wild Brain is, and I believe this to be the case, and I'd love to talk to anybody about it more. But it's a vertically integrated business where it controls the entire supply chain. They own or partner with the IP, they distribute it through Wild Brain, spark their AVOD business, and then they control the consumer products licensing as the agency manager. That is such a rare. Uh, quality to find in businesses and the businesses that truly do have that vertically inter- integrated um, component, um, those are often the, you know, the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 backers um, that, that we, we love to find. And I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case here with, 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 uh, with Wild Brain. And, and then, you know, really where we, our, our conviction, um, hold on, this, uh, the stop sharing. Um, I apologize, Graham. How do I share it again? Um, it looks like we're still seeing the presentation on our end of things. Let me pull this up really fast. Okay, I, I apologize. No problem. Um, okay, here it is. Now I have it on the full screen. Um, So where our conviction in this company really changed uh, big time was about a year ago. And that's really where we went all in. Um, You know, we talk about management. Oftentimes, I think, you know, the catalyst for unlocking value that I talked about earlier um, sometimes is apparent in in new management teams. And, you know, in August 2019, DHX Media named Eric Eric Ellenbogen as the CEO. I'll talk about him a little bit in in a second, but he has a proven resume in kids content. Um, so that was mid nineteen in in uh, that was mid nineteen and early December nineteen. DHX Media delisted from the Nasdaq. They changed its name from DHX to Wild Brain, which, as we know, was the name of its child-focused YouTube business, which was ne- renamed Wild Brain Spark. And really, for the last several quarters, Ellen Bogan has been busy putting the right management and deals in place, and we believe getting the company ready to emerge as a global leader in kids content. They actually reported earnings today. The stock is about flat, or it was flat um, on the day. I uh, it's just it, it's up barely, which is shocking to me. I thought the stock would be up 30, 35 percent. They announced a great quarter. Um, I I'm so excited about this investment. But you know, if you look at this next page here, I I, I would recommend that everybody go and listen to a replay of the of the conference call. I'm telling you, Eric Allen Logan, he's a stud. He's done a great job. He's going to do a great job with this company. Um, I talk about what we look for in businesses: a strong management team. Like I said, Eric Ellenberg, he has a proven con- he has a proven track record in Kins content. You can see he was the president of Marvel, left Marvel after it sold to Disney. Then he founded Classic Media, which became one of the largest private owners of branded kids content. He sold that business to DreamWorks Animation, and then at DreamWorks Animation, he became the head of TV, and then he sold that business to NBC Universal. Um, you know, as we know, he's now the CEO, like I said, at, at Wild Brain, he's been there for a year. Um, you know, there's a committed institutional shareholder base. This is out, out, outdated. Fine Capital Partners owns about 
forty percent of the company today. But I think you know I I, I boxed this uh, uh, bullet point right here. This is from the proxies data. But keep in mind that right now, Wild Brain, it, it, it's it, the, the the stock price is like a dollar twelve. It's a dollar twelve. Um, I would keep in mind that fifty percent of Eric Ellen Bogan's uh, cash compens uh, uh, compensation, he's required to use half of that to buy stuff. And then uh, the other, that that's fifty percent of his compensation, and he has to use fifty percent of that to buy stock. The other fifty percent of his compensation is stock based. Well, half of that stock-based compensation is paid in three equal tranches. And then the other half, the other 50% will vest as follows. And keep in mind that it's $1.12, the stock price. A third on the achievement of a stock price of $7, a third on the achievement of a stock price of $9, and a third on the achievement of a stock price of $11. I don't know that I've ever seen um, CEO compensation tied to uh, stock prices that are so far from being in money. But I think it, it it should give you some confidence in you know where he thinks, where we think, um, where fine capital thinks uh, this business is headed. Um, two, I, you know, I talk about strong competitive moat brands. I think this is very important uh, for anybody that has looked in the kids' content or or, or, or the, I guess the small cap content space before. Um, it is just littered with tons and tons of content companies that have never done anything but lose money for shareholders. And a big part of that is because, um, you know, these are companies where 99% of revenue is tied to content production and nothing is tied to consumer product sales. So I think that really, you know, weighs on the importance of Evergreen IP, the importance of Evergreen franchise brands. And you can see here that I write, um, you know, with, with dozens of media platforms for kids, original content based on franchise evergreen brands is paramount and you've seen this with you know the, the biggest content uh, kids content company out there disney you know part of why bob Iger has had such a great stint at disney and you've seen it he's gotten away from a lot of these one-off theatrical releases and he's really focused on the franchises where you can make a first and a second and a third and that's all tied to high margin consumer product sales but you know right here I, the, most of picture of movies have been hits but on a pure theatrical release basis, they're not all financially successful. Given that a studio retains about half the box office fall, the theater gets the rest. And then the marketing budgets are huge. It's roughly half the production budget. The actual content production profit is surprisingly low. And the case example I use here is Disney's Cars. So Cars is arguably um, you know, one of the top five uh, Disney franchises of all time, of all time. And it's estimated that Cars 1 made $120 million profit for Disney and Cars 2 lost money. That's not very impressive. However, from the sale of lunch boxes and stuffed animals, video games, bed shoes, and all of that consumer product stuff, the Cars franchise has generated global retail sales in excess of $20 billion for Disney. So I think when it comes to content creation, and once again, this is the knock against a lot of content companies. It's fair to think of a TV show or a movie as just a big commercial. And the only proof that your brand is evergreen or has a moat characteristic is translated into consumer product sales. And I would say that, um, um, you know, a small percentage of, of, of most content companies are very, and I mentioned this earlier, a very small percentage of consumer product sales are based uh, on IP. And that would either suggest that A, it's not a franchise property or B, management has just done a horrible job executing it and knows nothing about uh, that, 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 that whole 360 consumer product um, uh, 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 extension. And, and I think in the case for Wild Brain, it was probably a little bit of both. Um, so what is, you know, does Wild Brain, do they have a strong competitive moat? And like I said, that was one of my biggest uh, detractors from the company early on. And that all changed in 17, 18, when they bought the Peanuts franchise. And, um, you know, like I said, the Peanuts property, I believe, is a tentpole property that demonstrates that franchise brands can live on and prosper for years in the future. You know, Peanuts was created as a comic strip in 1950, and today, 70 years later, kids are still discovering that brand every day. And, um, you know, I did mention, right, that maybe this brand is kind of stale. How can you reinvigorate that brand? And, you know, you talk about, you know, Feather number one and you know Eric Elmboat or Arrow number one and 
Eric Ellenbogen's, you know, quiver was was the 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 the, the newly um, announced Apple TV partnership when he when he came to to Wild Green, and that Apple TV partnership will only give the Peanuts franchise a fresh makeover, and I think make the IP more relevant today than ever before. And um, they signed a deal with Apple TV. It's a multi-year, multi-project deal, uh, creating uh, a content exclusively for Apple uh, TV. They just um, last year released their first installment of of, of IP and, and Snoopy Snoopy in space in partnership with NASA. It was a hit. One of Apple TV's most watched shows. Um, it won a daytime Emmy. Um, I think that this is going to lend itself to giant, giant, giant consumer product sales uh, down the road. And as you know, I hear on the bullet point, that second bullet point talks about how licensing letter, a leading industry trade publication ranked Peanuts as the world's sixth largest character brand based on retail sales. And that's ahead of big brands like Paw Patrol, Frozen and Peppa Pig. And this is obviously before uh, Snoopy in space. So just imagine, you know, the possibilities. Um, I think it could just be huge. And, um, you know, that second income stream from consumer products is, is, is giant. And you can see that these, you know, these attached consumer products I right here, they're like oil wells that never cease pumping cash and include everything from toys, music, publishing, stationery, food products, school supplies, and on and on. So I believe uh, that, that, that just based on that, the company today tied to the valuation, right? You know, that price is what you pay, valuation is what you get. This is a cheap company. Um, it's, it's trading for, you know, eight, eight times EBD, EBITDA multiple. Just based on today and, and, and peanuts alone, I think this is a home run investment. Um, now, what makes this the 10 or 20 bagger would be what they could do with, with their other IP. And you go to this next page. So they have peanuts. Eric Ellenbogen talks a lot about this on the call. He talks about how what they're doing with the Peanuts franchise and what they're doing with Apple TV and Snoopy in space and a lot of the new content. It's bringing the top creators in the industry to Wild Brain and really kind of unveiling a lot of the other IP that they have. So these are examples of other IP that they have. And I think this is significant. So, you know, one of their brands is Strawberry Shortcake, which they bought from Iconics when they bought the Peanuts franchise. And unlike Peanuts, where they only own 40% of it, Sony owns the other 40% and the Schultz family still owns 20%. So that consumer products revenue and production revenue is chopped three ways. Well, with Strawberry Shortcake, they, don't, they own 100% of that brand. Um, Strawberry Shortcake is a defunct brand. And you know anybody that remembers that from the early 90s, it was huge. It was a huge brand. It's a defunct brand. There's been no meaningful content being created for that brand in decades. And Wild Brain is in the process of redeveloping that brand and reintroducing it on their AVOD network, Wild Brain Spark. And keep in mind, on their AVOD network, they control that distribution too. They're not giving up uh, rights to, to you know, maybe an SVOD player or anything like this. And I think this is really important. Like I said, Strawberry Shortcake is a defunct brand. What are Strawberry Shortcake's possibilities? I don't know, but you could read here that in the 1990s, Strawberry Shortcake was first introduced as a one hour home video product uh, project for 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment. They spent 200, the owner of that IP at the time spent $250,000 creating that content. Over the next five years, Strawberry Shortcake did $5 billion of retail sales with 300 licensees and 600 products in the marketplace distributed worldwide. Um, I'm not guessing or, or, or assuming that they get back there, but you could see the possibilities if you could even get somewhat back there. This other example here, Teletubbies, you know, on Eric Ellen Bogan, they, they own Teletubbies on his first call, they own hundred percent of it. On his first call as CEO in mid 19, he talked about, um, you know, the, the, the new 360 approach to brand development. And on that call, he highlighted how Teletubbies, which was, you know, despite what you think of the brand, it was a huge, huge success uh, in the early 2000s. Over the, that prior year to Eric Allen Bogan getting there, Teletubbies had done less than a million dollars in consumer product sales in that prior year. This was a brand that once again, was doing several hundred million dollars per year in retail sales. And that's just two, you know, down below there's multiple others. Um, you know, they, they have a new project revenue roll here that they're distributing on their AVOD platform. Um, right now, they have two two pieces of IP uh, on Netflix: Johnny Test and Chip and Potato. Um, they have some with with you know linear broadcast. But 
I think as they build these brands, and Eric Ellenbogen actually talked about it on the call this morning, he said, we start with the content, we'll chase with the consumer products. So build the content, make the content resonate, and then you could chase with the consumer products you know, further down the road. And I think they're in the early stages. I think a lot of content companies, and it's been proven, they launch uh, toys and consumer products too early. That's what happened with former management. They did a Teletubbies launch several years ago and, and, and it didn't work. It Part of the reason it flopped is because they led with consumer products way too early. Um, Bogan, he dropped a great quote on the line today. He said, uh, if it grows like a weed, it usually is a weed. Um, so, you know, develop the product and then chase with consumer products after the point. Now, this is to me, uh, the business is exciting based on their own content. This is the most exciting piece about the business. And this is the breakout business, Wild Brain Spark. Several years ago, um, a Wild Brain started producing AVOD content, which stands for Advertising Video On Demand on their on, on YouTube and on Amazon, on, on the different AVOD platforms. And they have had, uh, they've had such a great success with it um, that now they're doing it for, for third parties. And with a lot of these third parties, they you know take a slice, they're, they're hired as channel manager, but they take a slice in consumer product sales. You can see that, that they um, now feature more than 225,000 videos for over 650 kids' brains in over 20 languages. Now, this is really crazy to me. One in three kids worldwide with access to YouTube watch video content on Wild Brain Spark, which is just insane. And if you look at these two graphs below, you can see how quickly views are growing and how quickly revenue tied to this AVOD effort has been growing year over year. It's a huge growth business. At some point, it will be the biggest piece of the business. And that's when I think people start uh, you know, valuing this as, as a growth company. Um, as a growth tech type company rather than a, a, a you know, stable consumer products company. Um, it's a breakout business uh, in two ways. Um, the first way would be the massive advertising opportunity. You know, Eric Ellenbogen has talked a lot about on previous calls and he talked a lot about it on the call today that he's been in this business for a long time and 100% of the time, and it's always been this way, advertisers follow eyeballs. And right now, the kids' content space, there's four and a half billion dollars per year of advertising money spent um, in kids. And I believe that Wild Brain Spark could could attract uh, a big, uh, a nice portion of that, based on that that whole comment about advertisers follow eyeballs. And you could see right here, Wild Brain has a very compelling pitch for advertisers. Um, Spark has an average of four billion viewers per month. And that compares to Nickelodeon with 1.3 million daily viewers, Disney with 760,000 daily viewers, and Cartoon Network with 640,000 daily viewers. And you can see this chart I put together. I think you put that in front of any advertiser, um, you're going to have great success. They hired a guy recently just to kind of um, uh, Charles Gabriel to, to, to lead the push and to, to direct advertising. And I think the, 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 the opportunities are huge, huge. And this becomes a massive growth industry. Um, I think another area in which this is an exciting breakout business is as a brand builder and then discover a third party IP. Um, so due to the success with their own brands that I talked about, like strawberry shortcake and peanuts, dozens of third party brands and toy companies such as Playmobil, Smurfs, and several others, they've turned to Wild Brain to develop their AVOD strategies. Um, you know, Ellen Bogan has referred to Wild Brain Spark as a brand builder. And by doing this, the company can identify and then partner with new content that kids want. Uh, this content can be produced quickly at 120th the cost of a cartoon for TV because YouTube cartoons are shorter and of varying qualities. And that means the production can be profitable rather quickly. And then I think furthermore, and this is important, Wild Brain's analytics tools can test that new IP, see what's gaining views, and then partner with those content creator, creators and IP owners to bring that content to a broader audience and potentially partner in consumer product sales. So these are just two examples that I think are just incredible. So in two, so you know, Universal has this huge uh, vault of, of 
old stodgy kids content. And um, one example here is, is Woody Woodpecker. And they've done nothing with Woody Woodpecker in decades. Um, so Wild Brain launched Woody, so they, they partnered with Universal and then they launched Woody Woodpecker YouTube channels in Brazilian, Portuguese, and Spanish. Those channels immediately resonated. The Portuguese channel for Brazil was a breakout hit. The Brazilian channel organically attracted 2 million subscribers and the Spanish channel over 700,000 subscribers coupled with it, uh, extremely high engagement. And this had led to the opportunity to create new content. And Woody Woodpecker is like now one of the top family brands in, in, in Brazil because of what Wild Brain Spark has done. The second example of Sunny Bunnies, you can see after, so Sunny Bunnies, um, it's a Russian owned uh, piece of kids IP. And after season one, the official Sunny Bunnies uh, uh, YouTube channel uh, had, had 1200 subscribers. Um, and this is after, after season one, they were on a Disney channel just in Russia. And they, their YouTube channel had 1200 subscribers. So wanting to expand the brand, um, the creator approached Wild Brain uh, as channel manager. Uh, Wild Brain's team of talented YouTube experts, they transformed the Sunny Bunnies channel from 1,200 subscribers to a top 1% global YouTube channel. Wild Brain was able to generate more than 600,000 views per day and grew the channel to 325,000 subscribers and 1.8 billion minutes of watch time. And leveraging the success, Sunny, Sunny Bunnies was able to secure a master toy partnership and earnings from that channel have funded further content development and Disney actually bought Sunny Bunnies about a year ago. Um, and then you could see these are just a bunch of other examples. That's just the beginning. It's just getting started. Um, just recently they've announced with like three different uh, toy companies. Um, these toy companies are, are, are launching this new toy concept and they're creating uh, content first. Wild Brain's creating content first on Wild Brain Spark to grow the brand and then it will follow with, with toys and products. And these are all brands at this point where, where um, Wild Brains are going to have a significant piece of consumer products revenue. So, you know, Eric Ellenbogen, he said early on, um, are, is Wild Brain going to discover the next hit in kids' content? Um, he said, no, but we will likely have the next hit, hits, plural, in kids' content, meaning that you know, you never know what's going to resonate. People waste a lot of money and energy trying to create the next big hit that will resonate. But because of Wild Brain's scale and size and no one else is doing this, they have the ability to identify what kids like in all the different parts of the world and then partner with that creator to, to you know, then identify the next big hit. I think the opportunity is gigantic. And think back to the strawberry shortcake example where that one small investment resulted in $5 billion of consumer product sales over the following years. Um, you know, so once again, lastly, valuation. I think the company's cheap. It's trading at about eight times EV to EBITDA multiple. They announced earnings today, net income, cash flow growing significantly year over year. I, it's crazy that the stock price isn't up. You know, the big knock against the company is it has a lot of debt. Right here, it's a point, uh, 5.1 uh, net leverage ratio. That's uh, Declined significantly. Um, but I think what's important uh, when a company has debt is can they service that debt? Can they pay down that debt? And in Wild Brain's case, they can easily service it and they have multiple means of reducing that leverage ratio. And I think it's only a matter of time before that happens. Um, then lastly, so, so anyways, uh, that so that takes you to 69% of our portfolio. And the last thing I want to talk about is Raphael Holdings. And that takes you to, you know, close to 75, 80% of our portfolio. I am Super excited about Raphael Holdings. It might sound speculative at first, but um, you know, once again, get back to what I said about uh, situations where it, it's just the, the re risk return is so asymmetric. And this is this is clearly the case here. I do not think it's very speculative. I am super excited. You know, I talk a lot about owner managers. One uh, owner manager that we have followed for many years, and I think he just has an incredible, incredible uh, nose for opportunity is a guy named Howard Jonas. Um, Howard Jonas founded a company called IDT Corporation in 1990 as a provider of a call reorigination uh, service, so, so a telecom company. Um, he took his company public in 96 and built the 
point where today it generates 1.5 billion in revenue per year in the sale of communications and payment services. Um, he's had a lot of success in telecom, but he started talking about close to 20 years ago about how you know telecom is just a commodity and he wants to you know own IP and own other assets and. He's been incredibly successful at creating value for his shareholders by using the cash flows from the core shrinking business to fund a wide uh, array of growth initiatives. And you can see here in the past five decade or in the past decade, IDT has spun off five public companies. He sold the six after which it provided a special dividend. I would note that we own all of these spinoffs. Um, Raphael's the largest exposure and it's the one that we're most excited about. Um, had you invested in IDT Corporation in January of 2010 and kept each of the spinoffs, an investment in IDT plus the spin co has generated roughly 45% annual returns versus 10.8% of the S&P 500. So clearly Howard Jonas has a track record of success and a track record of allocating capital effectively. I think it, it um, would, would heed any investor well to just uh, at least pay attention to what he's doing. Um, you know, you could see I, I here you have access to the presentation later. You could see some of the, their bigger successes. Um, his biggest success was a company called Straight Path Communications, which some of you may recall. But in 2001, Jonas Jonas uh, bought uh, a swath of U.S. Aero Spectrum licenses for 56 million dollars from One Star Communications out of bankruptcy. Um, he spun those assets off into, into Straight Path Communications. Um, and in May 2017, he sold Straight Path to Verizon for $3.1 billion. So pretty incredible. Paid $56 million for those assets, sold it for $3.1 billion um, 18 years later. So, you know, I think what's hard for a lot of people when they follow these great owner managers is, you know, 18 years is a long time, but look at that return. And that return didn't come evenly dispersed over those 18 years, it, you know, shareholders you know it i think it was spun off in 2013 um yeah it was spun off in 2013 and shareholders you know had to go through a lot of volatility before it was sold in 17. so um you know we believe that howard is just in the early innings of his business success uh, right now uh, several of the spins Raphael, idw zedge genie um they're all publicly traded hold uh publicly traded we own them all I think IDT still has several breakout businesses um, that they're going to spin off in the future. You know, Net2 Phone, which is a UCAS business, National Retail Solutions is a point of sale network, and Boss Revolution is an international money transfer business. I think all of those eventually get sold off, uh, spun off. We'll own all of those. Like I said, our largest exposure is Raphael Holdings. So, Raphael, it's a little different. Once again, doesn't have a whole lot to do with what, what, doesn't have a whole lot to do with telecom, but 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 it's interesting. And uh, um, how I think it's interesting to note that Howard um, is obsessed with Raphael. He spends 99% of his time thinking about Raphael, and uh, it's become a pretty incredible company. But you know, just to give you a, a little background, um, Howard was shortly after one of his big monetizations, he was introduced to someone uh, on the business operations side of Raphael. And this is, um, I think, like back in 2011. And, um, you know, R Raphael Pharmaceutical, they were a, 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 a cancer company. And they were working on a drug uh, based on a science called altered metabolism. So just to give you a quick background on altered metabolism, um, you know, chemotherapy is, is uh, highly effective on cancers, but it's toxic to a lot of people and kills them. They can't, they can't stand the toxic, toxicity. Uh, then you have immunotherapy, which is highly effective, but doesn't work on all cancers. So, you know, cancer metabolism is a, is a new class of treatment. And this treatment, uh, the medicine targets the mitochondria of just the cancer cells and leaves the healthy cells alone. Um, and it's usually used as a combination medicine. So, you know, Howard was introduced to this, the, this uh, business operations guy years ago, thought it was interesting, what a noble cause trying to cure cancer. Um, you know, Howard was pre-med in college, has always had an interest in medicine, had the capacity and just, you know, trying to be a good, um, uh, you know, do-gooder uh, for society said, hey, if, yeah, you know, if, if you need a board member, I'd, I'd love to help. And I always 
joke around and say you can never have enough billionaires on your board. So Howard joined. Um, so Howard, uh, you know, joined the board in 2013. Uh, um, you know, at the point at that time, I don't think he necessarily had any uh, uh, visions for what this could become. Uh, but fast forward several years, he saw the um, the advances that they were making. And in 2005, the company uh, was running out of cash and needed cash. Howard brokered a deal where he uh, forked over a large amount of cash in exchange for roughly a 50% uh, or 56% majority stake in Raphael Pharma. And he took that ownership underneath the IDT umbrella. So once again, has it under the IDT umbrella. He has a lot of venture investments under the IDT umbrella. Some of those um, grow up and he spins off. Some of them don't. Um, but over time, he became more and more uh, enamored by what they were doing, saw the results of what they were doing. And you can see here in the second half of 2018, he decided to spin off Raphael Holdings from uh, IDT Corporation. And you can see Raphael Holdings um, was made up of, of Raphael's real estate, uh, their majority stake in, in Raphael Pharma, and another majority stake that they have in a, in a separate biotech company called Hypomedics. So at the time of the spin, what was really interesting, if you just looked at the balance sheet, the, the carrying value of the real estate was about 100 million and uh, the market cap was 100 million. So you're basically buying the, the, the real estate uh, at, at book value when you were getting the, the farm asset for free. That's not quite the case today. The market cap's about 300 million, but still a third of the value is in the real estate. Um, now this is what uh, got Howard really excited. And this is when he decided to spin off the asset. So Raphael's lead, lead compound, CPI 613, it's achieved multiple and lasting remissions from some of the most uh, uh, difficult to treat form of cancers. Um, they've been given five different orphan drug designations and uh, they have two uh, phase three trials and in, in one in pancreatic cancer and one in AML. And uh, this is a little outdated. Um, the, the phase three trial for pancreatic cancer was actually just announced to be fully enrolled and they should be expecting interim analysis really any day, any day, any month, which could be a huge catalyst for this company. But I think what's interesting about, and, and like I said, he saw these results in the phase one trial before um, spinning off uh, Raphael Holdings and this gave him the conviction to spin it off. But in phase one clinical trials at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. So Raphael dosed 18 patients with CPI 613 uh, uh, that, were, that, that were having stage four metastatic pancreatic cancer. Um, you know, one thing that I, I would note is, um, you know, pancreatic cancer, as many of you may know, is a death sentence. Uh, the survival rate is less than 1%. Um, and it's a, it's a cancer that um, is incurable and, and many people have given up on it. So in phase one trials, um, Raphael dosed 18 patients. And out of those 18 patients, um, here it says there were three complete remissions. There were actually five complete remissions. Um, which is, which is incredible, uh, very incredible. And you could see that the objective response rate was 61%. And that compares to fulfirinox by itself has a complete remission of less than 1% and an objective response rate of 31%. So, you know, in, in, in the phase one trials, like I said, the, the complete remission rate is, is unheard of. And the objective respo response rate was, was double. And uh, really exciting, the FDA urged them to go straight to phase three trials. They launched phase three trials uh, for stage four pancreatic cancer in combination with fulfirinox. And uh, this has 14 locations, I think it was 17 locations and 500 patients. Um, they just announced a couple of months ago that they were fully enrolled. Uh, this is about a year ahead of schedule, which uh, gets you really excited. Um, uh, that's very rare, particularly in this COVID environment. And um, this is something that could be huge. And, you know, if it is, um, just to kind of walk you through how I think about valuation, um, the average uh, treatment uh, cost for a cancer drug that's patented is twelve to 15000 
um, 65% of the patients are living over a year. So that gets you to roughly $140,000 per treatment. So just to lowball that, say 100,000 per treatment, there's 50, 60,000 pancreatic cancer patients every year in the United States. If this gets approved, it's a standard of care. This becomes a you know five to six billion dollar drug, um, and and uh, big pharma you know would typically buy an asset like this for three to five times. Um, so just taking three times, this gets you to a fifteen billion dollar drug. Raphael Holdings owns half of it. That's seven and a half billion. This is a market cap of three hundred million. So you know the upside is gigantic, and the downside is somewhat protected by the fact that they have a third of the market cap in real estate. And then I would also, you know, mention that they they own the other biotech asset, and then they also they just created something called the Bayer Institute, which is kind of their next generation pipeline. The Bayer Institute is named after Saul Bayer, who founded um, Cell Gene and sold it to Bristol Myers, and they're working on some really exciting things there. And keep in mind, this is just pancreatic cancer. This is interesting. So if you look at this picture right here, this is Raphael reading the bell on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Howard Jonas is in the middle there in the red tie. And you could see to his to his right that is Earl Grassi, and to his left is uh, David Wingo, and uh, both uh, were people that that registered as as um, actually objective response rate patients in the phase one trials. That's why I said it was five because neither of them were included as complete re remission because they they had just joined the trial and, and you know today they would they, they would have. One of them has passed away, but they would have uh, filtered into that complete remission uh, uh, category. So um, uh, Earl Grassi, who is there on the right, he has a blog that he keeps. It's actually pretty interesting. You should go read it. It's www.cpi613.com. And he talks about um, you know, his experiences, his testimonies, a lot of the other patients on the trials. I think he just underwent like his 110th treatment and he's feeling good and traveling and um you know like i said these sort of results it, I, I mean really it's statistically imp hey sorry about that i my, my laptop died but i basically got through it all so the, the only thing i didn't get to is um i talk about a out licensing partnership they had in japan with ono pharmaceutical which is one of the largest uh uh, pharma companies uh, in Japan, and they they wrote them a check for 12 million up front and 150 million tied to certain milestones. So I think that that's another thing that kind of um, you know maybe mutes some of the downside. So you know Raphael, it's a company led by incredible management. It, you know the chairman Howard Jonas is really just the visionary. If you look at the doctors and the medical people associated with the company. Um, it, it's, it's some of the, the brightest minds in medicine. And uh, like I said, they've completed phase three trials um, and that's just for pancreatic cancer. And there's all sorts of other indications I didn't even talk about. So that's another great example of, like I said, just being aligned with you know, great management, looking for situations where the reward risk dynamic is very asymmetric. Um, so, you know, they're between Raphael and Wild Brain and, um, you know, the uranium companies and gold, that's a huge part of our portfolio. And I'm just beyond excited about all of those investments. For sure. Well, in that case, we can go ahead and jam through these couple of questions we have here real quick. Yeah. I'll go ahead and feed them to you and we'll get some quick answers from you. Great. Thank you. All righty. So looks like uh, first question we have here. Any thoughts on the upcoming election impact on markets? Anything like that? Um, you don't. Not really. I. I. I look. I. We, we try to. Obviously, you need to have an opinion. We try not to get you know too macro in terms of our our, our thoughts on the market and. Um, you know that's why we try to own things that that we think could do you know, could do well either way. You know, I, I do think as far as it relates to the, the, the gold investment, I do, I just do think the, you know, uncertainty and the social unrest and, um, I, you know, it just seems like a huge percent of the population is just very angry with their, their lot in life. And I think that really plays into, you know, to assets like gold. Gotcha. And moving on to our next question, and I think we have a, a fairly 
confident answer in this already, but it's looking like the future for uranium and your guys' opinion is pretty blue sky. Things are looking good. Yeah, uh, you know, very much so. Uh, you know, like I said, we're, we're at a situation now where a lot of the long-term contracts uh, between the, the, the miners and the utilities have, you know, they've begun to roll off, they continue to roll off, and and the uh, the utilities, they need to secure, you know, new supply. And and the producers have been, you know, buying from the spot market to, do, to deliver into those contracts, and, and there just isn't a lot of, material there so it's you know not a matter to us of of if it's when and uh, we think it's close gotcha and you mentioned during the presentation there's some funds and investors that you like to follow um, you would you mind highlighting you know two or three of them yeah so I, look I mean there are a lot uh, you know so the obvious one is like you know something like Berkshire Hathaway and, and you know the only point there being um, you know we're, you know we're not going to go buy you know Japanese trading companies because Berkshire did but but they're smart they do a lot of great work I think it, it it's very um, it, it just makes sense right to try to reverse engineer that idea now ultimately you need to make it your own idea um, you can't abdicate your, you know, your re research efforts to, to someone else, but but it just makes sense to try to, like I said, see if you can see what they do. Um, you know, in terms of ones uh, that we watch, oh, I, so I, I'd say, in, you know, in terms of the 13F filings, it's, um, you know, names like uh, Stan Druckenmiller and Ray Dalio and... Uh, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, you know, Fairholm Fund, um, you know, Fine Capital. But I, I would say probably more so than, than names like that, that file 13F holdings. It would be more attributed to kind of people that I've talked about, uh, you know, developing a network with over time. And a lot of them are smaller fund managers, but there's a, there, I mean, there's a lot of great ones. There's a... Um, I mean, I mean, some are so small you, you've never heard of them. But then there are smaller ones like, uh, you know, Stephen Keel at Arquitos Capital Management, Scott Miller at Greenhaven, um, uh, you know, La Laughing Water Capital Management. Uh, it, you know, there's a number. There's there's a big list of people that I have kind of you know in my network, and I just I just think they're smart and they do a good job, and I'd be foolish not to not to try to look at what they own and understand their thesis. Definitely. Anyway, and, and by the way, the, the one other thing that I would note is, you know, in terms of, you know, guru focus, that's that's one area where I think, you know, guru focus and your, your, your service is great. I mean, you've identified a lot of those, you know, great managers and capital allocators. Um, oh, and then in addition to other managers, I, I would uh, say, you know, keep a, an eye on certain capital allocators. You know, from and a lot of these guys are business leaders, but you know, like John Malone, anything John Malone does, I think, is interesting. Is the Liberty Media Complex, you know, Barry Diller at IAC. I think anything that Barry Diller at IAC does is interesting. You know, Barry Diller, he he basically built the, you know, the Expedia and travel platforms. He built the, you know, the dating, the, the, the match group. Um, you know, and you know, today he's still at it. He, you know, the biggest piece of IAC today is Angie Home Services. And then he, you know, owns a bunch of, you know, app businesses and Vimeo. And there's no one better than IAC at a lot of these, you know, business to business and business to customer uh, digital platforms. So I would say anything that IAC and Barry Diller do. Um, you know, Howard Jonas, I talked about Howard Jonas. We talked about Raphael, but a lot of his other companies are interesting. You know, Zedge. IDW Media, which is a comic book content production company, um, a bunch of businesses, you know, in particular the Net Two Phone business, which I imagine he'll spin off at some time here. You know, you look at that UCAS business and look at the valuations that a lot of these uh, UCAS companies like Ring Central and um, you know Eight by Eight get, and, and you know, once spun off, Net Two Phone could easily have that same sort of valuation. Uh, you know, people like uh, other names like Bill Sturitz. 
you know, Eddie Lampert, I think, you know, people think Eddie Lampert's the, you know, the village idiot with his Sears debacle, but, you know, he's still a, a smart, driven guy, and I, you know, keep a close eye on someone like him. Um, you know, so there's, you know, a number of people. You know, one book that I would recommend, um, many of you have, 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 may have read it, but it's a book called The Outsiders, and it was written by Will Thorndike, uh, who's a professor at Harvard Business School. And, you know, in the, in the prologue of the book, he talks about, you know, what makes a great CEO. And he talks about um, Jack Welch from GE kind of being, you know, what most people think is a, was a great CEO. And, you know, his point is Jack Welch was a, a, a good CEO, but he wasn't even in the same zip code as a lot of the guys he talks about in, in these chapters. And, you know, he has a, a, a chapter on like eight different guys and, you know, one was, you know, Bill Anders at Capital Cities. Uh, you know, one's on Warren Buffett. Uh, one's on John Malone. One's on uh, uh, Henry Singleton from Teledyne. But, you know, really talks about how the most important job of, of, a, of a CEO, chairman, is, is capital allocation. So your business generates cash. What do you do with that cash? Do you invest it in your, in your business? Do you buy other companies? Do you pay down, uh, down debt? Do you, you know, pay dividends and, and, you know, the point being that, that you know, the, the, the capital allocation you, you use, the capital allocation tool that you use at different parts in that, that company's, you know, business cycle greatly impact, um, you know, the results. So that, that's very much, you know, how we think about companies and, and managers that we invest in. Definitely. And when you're looking at a, a company trying to determine growth, are there any specific factors you're looking at, or are you making big predictions? Uh, no, you know, not really. I, I think you know, ideally, you look for a company that's you know growing revenue, growing earnings, growing cash flow, doing it all. And you know, that's one reason why I'm so excited about you know our investment in Wildbrain. You know. So, you know, so Wild Brain work really kind of checks all the boxes. So revenues decline year over year, but if you listen to the last call, I think it's, it's very evident that that will soon be growing. Um, so you're going to have a company that's, like I said, growing earnings or, or growing revenue, growing earnings, growing cash flow, paying down debt, and it's a business that is in an industry that is experiencing, you know, great, great uh, growth tailwind. Um, but I think if you could find something like that, I, I, I mean, the more, the more, the better. And, and then obviously valuation is paramount. So you don't want to overpay for that asset, right? And, you know, price is what you pay, value is what you receive. So um, I think it's great to get growth, but not when you, you have to sacrifice uh, value. For sure. And do you have any opinions on the current state of nuclear waste destruction or disposal? Yeah, you know, so it's pretty interesting. I, I think that, um, you know, there's been a lot of fear-mongering, a lot of, you know, misinformation um, that has, has, you know, been spread. And, um, you know, in terms of the waste, um, you know, one thing, well, so I would say first off, um, you know, a lot of people have this, this perception of, um, you know, nuclear waste being like green ooze that gets into the, you know, atmosphere. And I don't know whether that's from watching The Simpsons or something like that, but, you know, it's not true. Uh, you know, these are like little steel pellets that go into these, these fuel rods, and um, it's the safest and the cleanest. And, you know, in terms of the waste, um, so in a nuclear power plant, a fifth of that fuel is replaced every year. Well, that fuel, it's stored in large pools inside the plant and over the, for one year. And over the course of that year, um, it loses 90% of its radioactivity. Um, at that point, it's stored in, in steel caskets and it's stored on site in that nuclear power plant. And they say over that period, of a couple of decades that it's stored in the plant, it loses another 90% of its radioactivity. So, I, you know, at this point, it's lost like 99.9% .9 of its radioactivity. Um, and then it's, you know, stored, I think, like three or four miles underground um, in, t 
to you know bedrock and steel caskets and you know they they say all the like the nuclear waste um, ever produced like in the United States can be stored on you know like in a basketball gymnasium you know stack uh, you know a couple of, of yards you know high so you know clearly that needs to be addressed but I I think it largely has I think um, a lot of the storage uh, situations for that waste um, it's safer than people think and like I said I think you've seen you've had a lot of fear mongering tactics from environmentalists but one thing that you see changing fast is, is you know it's kind of uh, starting to become this kind of like bipartisan you know support for for it as a fuel source and you know at one point uh, the Trump campaign was very pro-nuclear and the Biden campaign was kind of anti-nuclear but I think a lot of that had to do with uh, you know Republicans and Democrats can never agree and you just take the opposite side and you know as the the Biden campaign, as we get closer here, and they've, you know, are forced to, to study climate change, and it's becoming, a, it's a bigger issue today than ever before. The drumbeat's growing louder and louder. Um, I mean, now the Biden campaign might even be more pro-nuclear than, than the Trump campaign. So um, I just think the, 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 this is like a multi-decade, uh, I, I think, growth scenario. For sure. And one of the viewers was wondering uh, why you have the, the GDX ETF on top of gold miners. Right. So uh, the GDX, uh, so actually what, what that GDX position was, um, we bought kind of deep out of the money uh, call options on, on the GDX, and it was kind of like a, like a call option on the gold price, a magnified way to kind of, um, you know, play that. So... Uh, that's been a great investment for us. Um, you know, when you look at our 13F filings, um, it's a little misleading because, you know, when you own option positions, it shows up as, as like your notional exposure. So I think that the GDX position shows up as like a, maybe like a 30 or 40 percent position in our in our 13F filing, which is not the case. That's the notional exposure. Gotcha. And. Any thoughts on the Kirkland Lake Gold Gold Mining Company? Um, I think it's a great company. Uh, low, you know, all in sustaining costs. We like the management team. I uh, I would just say in general, um, you know, all these gold miners will will, will do well uh, in the environment that we think we are going to see in gold. Um, and then it's up to us to pick the best companies. And we just think Kirkland Lake is, is, is one of the best, you know, in the industry. And I would also, you know, note that an important thing to us with gold miners would be, um, you know, not only great management, but, but um, you know, owning companies that have their reserves and what we think are, are government-friendly jurisdictions. You know, the last thing we want to do is wake up one morning and find out that the gold mine has been, you know, confiscated by by the government, and you've seen that with other companies. So, I think the the ones that we own, their their reserves are in, in like I said, uh, friendly um, regions of the world and, and high, high quality mines, led run by good management teams. For sure. And when you're looking at margins, do you focus in any one place? Say gross margin or operating margin, net margin, anything like that? I think it's all important. I think it's all important. Um, you know, I, 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 I think I probably tend to focus most on operating margins, but, but like I said, I think it's all important. And, um, and you know, definitely look for companies um, uh, where there are high margin opportunities. You know, to go back to Wildbrand, one of the reasons I get so excited about that is you know, the companies today, I, the, the margin profile is attractive, but, you know, if they do land on a couple of these hits, um, that lends itself to consumer product sales. And, you know, I, I don't think there's a better business to own or a better business to, to be in than being an IP owner of, of a great product or franchise because that is, I mean, that's just about 100% margin business. For sure. And 
if you have a a 10-year investment horizon in a company, would you ever consider buying a stock if the share price dropped 5 or 10% and then reduce your cost basis by buying any future share price drops? Uh yeah, yes, but but you know, I think we we try to stay away from trimming and adding to positions too much. You know, I, I, I think, um, you know, after tax capital return, that's, you know, that, that's the ultimate uh, measure. And you know, if you trade around it too much, you erode into a lot of that. Um, you know, so I, so I, I guess yes, but, but we, we try not to get too fancy. You know, if it's a, if it's a great company, um, you know, buy it and then, uh, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, closely monitor, you know, that business's growth, but, but, you know, understanding that, that, you know, value is always changing and try to own businesses for the long term and don't worry about short term stock fluctuations. For sure. And getting on to our last question here, uh, when you're looking at cash flows, is there a particular one you like to focus on, whether it be from the cash flow statement or operating cash flow? Is the cash flow anything like that? Well, I, I think free cash flow, right, it, it would, would be the ultimate measure, but um, you know that's that's a measure that can't can't be you know manipulated by earnings. Um, but I, I look. I, I I think all valuation metrics are relevant, and and you know once we, um, you know when we value a, a company, we we kind of focus on traditional valuation metrics, and like I said, they're all important. Definitely. Well, that'll wrap up our questions here. So I'd like to you know put out a big old thank you to all those out in our audience that have been hanging out with us and bearing with through all of our technical difficulties that we've had but we made it through it and i'd like to thank you joe for the great presentation and for taking the time to answer these questions and spend some time with us yeah well thank you very much and i apologize that that uh my 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 laptop kind of cut off for a second but hopefully it wasn't too much of a disruption as i i try to call in definitely definitely And to all the audience out there, if you missed any part of the presentation at all, there'll be a full recap video available both here on YouTube and on GuruFocus.com. And we hope to see you next week for another featured guest and hope you enjoyed today's presentation. And from us here at Guru Focus and out to you and our audience as well, Joe, uh, we hope that everybody can just stay safe out there and stay healthy in these times. Thank you, everybody.